whenever I think of the brain, I, I, I think of GBMs, right? I think of these awful tumors, uh, which I guess for the listener, we can explain what that is. Um, so, so maybe tell folks what a GBM is, why a GBM is um, truly one of the cancers that gives cancer a bad name. And, and I guess my real question for you is, given that traditional surgery has historically never worked for this tumor, you mm-hmm. simply can't resolve it, and you think about the transition away from craniotomy, big open procedure, is there anything on the horizon for, for GBMs to, to render them less lethal? Yeah, it's a great question. So GBM stands for glioblastoma multiforme, and it's a mouthful (laughs) of a word. But um, if you break it down, um, what it's referring to, the glial part of that word refers to the cell origin. Um, The brain has different types of cells, and if you look in the big buckets, there's neurons, which are the ones that primarily are the ones that allow us to do thinking and function. And then there's a large population of support cells that we call glia, and that's that first part. Glioblastoma originates from those support cell population. Multiforme refers to, you know, these original descriptions histologically of the tumors that really showed um, um, multiple form, multiple histology. Some of the key features of it are the necrosis. The tumor grows so quickly that it outstrips its blood supply, and in its wake it leaves cell death, what we call necrosis. So like you alluded to, it really is, um, you know, a terrible kind of disease and condition. Um, We are making progress, and specifically around understanding what causes. So, Mm -hmm. you know, just 10 years ago, uh, you would remove one of these tumors, and you send it to the lab, and you could get the diagnosis of that this is a glioblastoma. Now, Uh, at most academic medical centers, you'll also get a genetic profile of the tumor. So nowadays, we actually know specifically what kind of mutations are involved in the tumor. And that's going to be really critical for this next chapter, which is using those genetic alterations actually to um, to tailor and personalize, you know, uh, chemotherapy and more. So um, this has big implications because um, we're now moving from an era where we use a visualization of the histology, now to this molecular profiling, which is more mechanistic. Um, the new chemo agents are really going to be targeting mechanisms as opposed to general things like cell cycle um, and metabolism and things like that. So um, these are the things that are changing, you know, and we need it to change faster. Um, there are also really exciting things that we're seeing around new ways to train the immune immune cells to to target things, it turns out that glioblastomas actually suppress parts of the immune system. So they, they're kind of like growing in stealth, and they activate you know molecules and cells in a, in a cloak way that can't be recognized by immune cells anymore. And so if we can basically allow the tumors to be recognized by the immune system, that could be something that really unlocks therapy in the future too. Um, but um, the things that we do know that work pretty well right now, at least in terms of prolonging survival for patients and really meaningful survival, actually still is around the surgery. We do know that the more extensive the resection, um, the longer the survival is, and that's been really well characterized now. But it's not curative, like you said. Mm-hmm. We can remove 99% or even 100 and beyond what we see on the MRI. Um, unfortunately, there's usually microscopic cells that go beyond what we can see on the MRI that are still there and over time will repopulate, you know, um, the tumor. And so it is a really complicated and, and, and tough disease, but we're working really hard on it. Do we have any idea what predisposes an individual to this from a risk perspective? Um, short answer is no. Because it afflicts is, young, it afflicts old. I yeah. mean, I've watched children die of this, teenagers, people in midlife, people right. at the end of life. It seems to have no apparent pattern. Yeah, and part of that has to do with its mechanisms. It's not something that we consider as a heritable mm-hmm. kind of risk. Um, but what it does rely on is a set of mutations. And it's never, it's rarely the same set. Right, which it's is a very why polygenic is, condition. Exactly, and that's what makes it you know, really tricky to treat. Um, when we talk about glioblastoma, we're actually not talking about one thing. We're talking about a system of genetic alterations that together 
have cascaded in, into the form that we see. And I suspect we'll, we'll come back to this, Eddie, but you've alluded to chemotherapeutic agents that can be used, whether it's to treat glioblastoma or anything else, including METs of other epithelial cancers that spread to the brain. Um, the blood-brain barrier poses a challenge yeah. for treatment. Do you think the future lies in treatment within the CMS, uh, the, C, the, the CSF, so treating directly inside, I don't know, intrathecally or directly into the central nervous system, uh, or do you think it's designing drugs that cross the blood-brain mm -hmm. barrier? I mean, what do you think the future looks like? I think it's going to look like all of the above, mm -hmm. actually. And this is a situation where we do need to look at all possible options. This is not like the kind of thing where we're thinking like, um, non-invasive or minimally invasive, like really something that will work is the first priority. Um, one of the technologies I'm, I'm really um, interested in following how this develops, and we're doing research on this at UCSF, is using focus ultrasound. So most people know about ultrasound to diagnose, but if you change the energy profile of it, you can actually use acoustic energy through mm -hmm. an ultrasound to uh, actually open up the blood-brain barrier in targeted parts of the brain. And so there is a lot of development on using that as a way to do delivery as opposed to putting a catheter or something directly in the brain. And then um, with that, a set of new agents that can be really molecularly specific to get to targets once you open up that blood-brain barrier. Yeah. I want to back up and just have people understand how you even do awake surgery because the traditional way that surgery is done requires general anesthesia. That's and right. general anesthesia typically requires three things. Um, it requires one type of medication uh, to, to blunt pain, yeah. another type of medication to block memory, <laughs> and another type of medication to paralyze you. Now, of course, if things go wrong and things have gone wrong, sometimes patients are paralyzed, but they feel pain, but they can't communicate it. And these are these catastrophic, but fortunately very rare events that occur in anesthesia. But, but correct anesthesia is done where a patient has no sense of time or memory of anything. They can't feel anything and they can't move, which means they're actually safe, right? right. It's, it's, to, it's to save them as well. So help us understand how it is that you can do surgery without all three of those conditions being present. I'm Peter Atia. This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights. You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment to a healthier future. Thank <laughs> you.